Uh, hi, I'm Fabian Nunez, uh, former Speaker of the California State Assembly. I'm currently a partner at Mercury Public Affairs, uh, which is a public strategies firm uh, in the United States and around the country, around the globe. In the early 90s, I was a community organizer, uh, focusing a lot of my time on organizing the most vulnerable sectors of our community, which at the time were undocumented immigrants who were being taken advantage of, and oftentimes by their employers, but social service agencies and, and other entities as well. So I spent a lot of my time um, organizing press conferences, uh, uh, organizing events, uh, meetings, rallies of community people who were being taken advantage of in one way or another. In the late uh, 1980s and early 1900s, we began to see um, a dramatic shift in terms of the political realities in California. California went from being one of the strongest economies in the country to, in the early 90s, uh, the state began uh, to feel the impact of an economic recession. Um, an impact that, that began very, very slowly, but it was really the demise of a lot of industries uh, that would, were, starting, were starting to leave California, um, and many of those were manufacturing industries in particular. Um, and so you saw that dramatic shift, but yet at the same time there was a demand for cheap labor in the state. Uh, that was not limited simply to the fields in the Central Valley in California where there was a need for farm workers to work under um, the hot sun uh, harvesting the crops, but it was also in the major cities, cities like San Francisco, Los Angeles, um, it, areas like Orange County, San Bernardino, and Riverside had a need for low-wage workers as well. Uh, whether it was factories in Los Angeles, where it was fancy restaurants in San Francisco, whatever the issue was, was that it, 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 was, a, it was a very difficult economic reality that California started facing, such that by the, the early 1990s, um, what you began to see is organizations grow, organizations like FAIR, um, and other organizations that look to control immigrate populations from coming uh, uh, to the United States. And you saw this not only in terms of groups that decided that the problem of the immigration issue wasn't just simply a problem that you contain at the border in terms of how you enforce border policies, but it really bled into everybody's daily life to the point where organizations like FAIR infiltrated groups uh, like the environmental groups under the population control uh, uh, notion that folks needed to have less babies. But really the, 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 the motive behind that had less to do with population control and more to do with a hidden agenda that many of these groups had. And really what it was, it was a divisive agenda to try and purify California and much of the country at the same time of non-whites that lived in this state. And that movement really took foot in California and took hold by 1992. And by 1993, we knew it was a real, real problem because you can tell, you can feel that the tension that was in the air in the state when Latinos and African Americans and Asians and other people of color came into contact with those elements in the community that really promoted the nativist mentality, the mentality that, you know, you couldn't have more people who didn't look like America is supposed to look. But that happened, in my view, in the early 1990s by 91, 92. I, I mean, I joined One Stop Immigration uh, in 1990. I uh, left San Diego. I was at the University of California in San Diego. Uh, and I got a call from a good friend, Salvador Reza, who said, we're organizing immigrants in Los Angeles. You should join us. Uh, and I did. I went to L.A. Uh, in Boyle Heights uh, to One Stop Immigration. I met Juan Jose Gutierrez. And at the time, um, Ronald Reagan had already passed the Immigration Reform and Control Act of 1986. Uh, and there were a number of people, over three million immigrants, that were in the pipeline 
to become legal residents of this country. Uh, and so One Stop Immigration was working on not only le helping legalize uh, these undocumented immigrants, but also helping provide them uh, uh, education so that they can learn how to speak English as a requirement to obtain uh, their legalization status, their legal status in the U.S. And so when I came to the organization, um, I really enjoyed the work. There was no money to pay us uh, uh, to say. We, we made very, very little money, maybe minimum wage. Um, but we learned very quickly that there was a demand to organize these workers, whether it was in the factories where they worked, uh, in the restaurants where they worked, uh, or whether it was in their homes. And we knew that there were a lot of employers who were actually taking advantage of these workers. In fact, there were instances where employers, for example, after workers worked for two to three weeks on payday, right before workers were going to get paid, the employer would call the immigration authorities and then they would come and they would deport all of these undocumented people, send them back to their country of origin. Most of them were from Mexico and they would get deported. And so the laws that applied to IRCA, the Immigration Reform and Control Act, was two different pieces of law, of that law that were important. One was the sanctions against employers. In other words, it was very clear that if you were an employer, you could not hire undocumented persons. You had to hire legal residents or people who were in the pipeline to become legal residents. So what was happening is that the government was enforcing the law as it related to the workers, but they were never enforcing the law as it related to the employers. So the employer sanctions that were in the law, that was a very important aspect of the law, became a chit that employers would use to call immigration, have their workers deported, and then have the workers come back to do the work. And we learned that this was happening all over the state. And um, I called my friend Kevin De Leon, who was uh, at, at the University of California in Santa Barbara, and I said, "You got to come to Los Angeles. We're organizing workers here, and I think you would really appreciate the work that we're doing. This is this is what we've been talking about our whole lives: helping workers and and immigrants have a better life for themselves and fight for their own rights." Um, so Kevin came by to uh, to see One Stop. He met with Juan Jose and, and myself and some of the other people at the organization. And you know, overnight, he decided to also remain there and to continue the, the work of organizing uh, undocumented immigrants. And so from there, we uh, really built what we considered to be at the time you know, one of other organizations that were also there to defend the rights of immigrants. But we felt that one of the distinctions that we had at One Stop Immigration was that we wanted to focus on the most vulnerable population. We wanted to organize the people who we knew other people perhaps weren't already talking to. And that was people who may be in the pipeline, may not be in the pipeline to become legal residents. Um, and we decided that it was important for these workers to know their rights. So we spent a lot of time talking to people about what to do, for example, um, when the immigration authorities appeared at their home uh, or at the schools as they were dropping off their children in the schools. Uh, families who were mixed families, where, for example, you had half of the family who was in the pipeline to become legal, legal residents and the other half wasn't. What to do in those kinds of circumstances, um, as well as what their rights are as workers. Uh, you know, lunch, uh, lunchtime, eight-hour workday, uh, the time and a half that they needed to be paid by their employer uh, if they worked overtime, um, and all those things that ultimately um, people really need to know uh, uh, because whether they were undocumented or not, they had rights under the law, under the Constitution, and under the laws uh, that govern this state. Well, when we were at One Stop Immigration, uh, one of the first things that we learned uh, doing the citizenship classes was that a lot of people were fine taking the necessary hours to learn how to speak basic English uh, as a requirement to become legal residents, but many of them didn't want to become citizens uh, for two reasons, and very simple reasons. One, they didn't feel fully welcome in America, uh, and two, 
they felt um, a sense of belonging to the, their country of origin. So it took a lot of work to convince them to say, you live in the United States now. You're never going to go back to Mexico or El Salvador or Nicaragua or Guatemala. This is your home now. You're raising your children here. So you need to make this your home. Um, we went to the extent of even going to the political parties in Mexico as they were coming to the U.S. to campaign uh, for the federal elections to insist uh, whenever they spoke to Latinos in the United States to insist on telling them that they should become citizens of the U.S. Uh, but it was a difficult process. Ultimately, I think people listened, not because we gave them good advice, but because they saw the writing on the wall. They, know, they knew that if they didn't stand up to fight for themselves, that ultimately the sacrifices that they were making for their own kids uh, would be in vain because they knew that ultimately the fight of those who wanted to take them on wasn't just to take on the parents. They wanted to take on their, kill, their kids as well. So I think that that is really ultimately what led a lot of them to decide to become uh, citizens of this country and apply for naturalization. Proposition 187 uh, was an initiative that ultimately would have denied every child, every man and every woman in the state of California who wasn't a legal resident the right to exist in this state. There would be denied medical care. There would be children would be denied access uh, to preventive care. They would be denied the right to attend a public school in the state of California. And it would turn every doctor, nurse, and teacher into an immigration officer. That would require each and every one of them to turn over anyone whom they sus suspected was undocumented. And so essentially, the, the, the basis of Proposition 187 was to distance the level of humanity of an undocumented person from the rest of the population, to make them less than. It wasn't enough to call them, quote unquote, illegal aliens. This was an effort to rid them of their humanity in the state. I heard about 187 first in 1993, uh, a press conference that was held um, with a gentleman by the name of Alan Nelson, who was the former uh, regional director of the Immigration and Naturalization Service. Um, and I remember that announcement being made that they were going to begin to collect signatures uh, to put this initiative, very pernicious, mean-spirited initiative on the California ballot. And I remember that I was organizing, at the time, uh, workers in Pomona, California. And when I learned of it, I couldn't believe it at first. Uh, because the, my initial instinct was, this can't be true. I know that uh, Governor Pete Wilson and others were trying to convince uh, Congress to pass a law at the federal level to deny children of undocumented persons uh, their birthright rights under the Constitution. Uh, and I always thought that that was such a far-fetched idea, but never in my wildest imaginations did I think that here in the state of California, in, in the Golden State, that these individuals would try uh, to uh, pass an initiative. And it came home. That's when it hit home. That's when it was no more a question of, okay, this is just political rhetoric by some nativist activist who want to get people's attention. It became an issue of, we're in a real fight and we have to organize because this is going to be very, very difficult to win over all of the voters of the state of California. I mean, we knew they had a long way to go in 93 because they still had to collect something uh, around the neighborhood of 385,000 signatures from valid California voters. And we didn't know that they were going to be able to reach that objective. But yet it was the beginning of an effort uh, that ultimately taught us that uh, this was going to be a real fight. It was no longer going to be, you know, a fight that we were going to have in, in a debate. It was now real. It was, it, it was going to go to the ballot if they collected those signatures that were required of them. In the early 70s, Pete Wilson was elected 
mayor of San Diego. Uh, this is around the time my family had moved back from Tijuana. And I remember Pete Wilson because he came to my school uh, when I was a kid and he talked about the things that kids need to do in order to get good grades and to have a good life. And I thought Pete Wilson to be a nice fellow. I thought that, you know, this is a mayor who cares about everyone. And then eventually he ran for uh, a U.S. Senate. And Pete Wilson was not someone that people thought uh, had a diabolic agenda to get rid of all the immigrants. Uh, we just thought that he was a, a decent person who really wanted the best for California. And we never thought that we would be on the other end of his attacks. Well, first you have to remember that the, the year before Pete Wilson's re-election at the end of, in the fall of 1993, the polling showed that Pete Wilson was running behind the Democratic nominee for governor at the time. And Kathleen Brown, who was the Democratic nominee, um, had Pete Wilson by five to ten points, if I recall correctly, in the polls. Um, why? Because by 93, um, the economic collapse of California's tax system was really fragile at the time. And it was clear that the only way Pete Wilson was going to be able to be reelected governor of this state was if he was able to figure out how to fortify the California economy. In other words, how do you strengthen the economy so you can get reelected? Because people will judge you on the basis of how well the economy is. Where's, you know, what is the jobless rate? Um, are we strengthening the middle class? Um, you know, what are the economic opportunities in the Golden State for people? So all of these things were working against Governor Pete Wilson at the time. So what happened by uh, the following year, early nine, 1994, Pete Wilson decided that the only way he would get reelected as governor was not by improving or fixing California's economic woes, because that would be too difficult for him to do. It was to find an easy way out. And his easy way out was to find a scapegoat. And his first scapegoat was the undocumented immigrants. So that if you see, for example, at the beginning of May of 1994, Pete Wilson ran his first political commercials to test whether or not it would simply be good enough for him to blame the undocumented immigrants for economic, economic woes. And it worked. He put commercials on television talking about how immigrants keep coming. It was entitled, They Keep Coming. Uh, and it showed floods of people crossing the border, something that really wasn't happening at the time. But he made it seem as if though the reason why we had a high unemployment rate, the reason why we had a shrinking middle class in California was because immigrants were taking other people's jobs, and it simply was not true. But what it did for him is it helped embolden his campaign, and you saw the numbers move very quickly to his support. And it wasn't just Republicans, incidentally, that moved to support Pete Wilson for re-election. It was moderate Democrats. It was liberal Democrats that lived along the coast. Uh, it was young people, it was old people, uh, it, it was people that were, that, that were middle-aged. Uh, it, it, it ran the entire gamut. Eventually what they did is this campaign to re-elect Pete Wilson really was not a campaign about re-electing Pete Wilson. It was a campaign about dehumanizing undocumented immigrants and blaming them for the ills of the state of California. And it worked. The mainstream political establishment felt that this was a wave California was moving in, in the direction of. In other, that in other words, immigrants were going to be blamed, that we needed to tighten the screws on immigration reform, that we needed to figure out ways to appease those who had the most reactionary rhetoric against immigrants, because if we didn't do that, we would never win a political election in California. And so, for example, at the end of 1993, you had a Latino that was a state legislator by the name of Luis Caldera introduce legislation 
to deny undocumented immigrants the right to drive a car. And that, to me, really was an inflection point for California. Because what it said to many of us who were activists in the community, it said the democratic political establishment is not there to help us. In other words, we, we're not just working against Pete Wilson and his cronies, you know, the Alan Nelsons and uh, the, the Howard Azels of the world. But our fight was with the entire political establishment. But it wasn't everybody in the political establishment. There were people, we mentioned uh, people like Richard Polanco, for example, people like Richard Alatore, uh, who was on the city council in Los Angeles, and many others who came to support the work that we were doing. But even they were concerned about losing the majority in the state legislature and the fact that Democrats could be outnumbered in the polls uh, by Republicans on election day and that we could lose not just Prop 187, that we could lose everything down the ticket from the governor's race down to the state legislature to the state assembly. And so what was at stake for them was merely a political situation. But what was at stake to us was very different than that because what we were facing was the defense of human beings who were being wrongfully blamed for something they did not do. In fact, we were looking at studies that uh, were conducted by the Urban Institute that demonstrated at the time that undocumented immigrants were contributing more than $28 billion a year to the economy in the U.S. than the money that they were receiving in services. But if you, but if you talk to ordinary people, they didn't know this. They just assumed, well, we have a bad economy, let's blame the undocumented immigrants. Once Prop 187 was uh, approved on the ballot, we knew, I think it was by July of 1994, um, we were summoned, uh, myself, Juan Jose Gutierrez, Kevin De Leon, were summoned to Sacramento uh, by then Speaker Willie Brown uh, to talk about the issues around the initiative with 187. So we went to Sacramento and had this meeting with Willie Brown where he sat us down and in the most eloquent and articulate fashion explained to us what was at stake in that 1994 general election for California. And essentially what he said to us was this, was that if uh, Prop 187 passed and if the anti-immigrant voters made their way to the polls in large numbers, not only would 187 pass, but that we would lose control of the state Senate and the state assembly. And he feared that organizing a march um, would contribute, would help contribute to galvanizing the voters who were anti-immigrant. That in other words, if all of these Latinos were marching down the street, which he supported and made very clear he would support, but felt that if we followed through with that march, that ultimately uh, we could be working against ourselves. In other words, we could be shooting ourselves in the foot in a significant way. And in the, in the process, we could be hurting the efforts of Democrats across the state of California to continue to do the good work around housing reform, around education reform, and, and the various things that, that Democrats would do uh, if they were the ones in power. And it was a very, very interesting meeting because we never thought that we would be sitting there talking to one of the most powerful people, uh, one of the most powerful Democrats in the country, uh, sitting us down and walking us through what was going to happen if we actually followed through with this march. And so, you know, we were sort of kind of kicking each other under the table, um, hoping that we would all kind of stay on the same page. Uh, but it was very clear to us that we needed to do this march, that there was nothing that anybody was going to say to us that was going to convince us to cancel it and to not allow the immigrants themselves to express their own humanity so that people can see that they're human beings and that as human beings, they have dignity and that they have a place in this state and they contribute to the state. And we felt that if we didn't follow through with the march, we would be betraying the same values that brought us to uh, uh, put these kinds of activities together in the first place. And so, you know, we sat there and sort of looked at one another. Yes, we were impressed that, that then Speaker Willie Brown uh, was, was giving us the FaceTime that, that he was giving us. But at the same time, we knew 
that was at sta what was at stake for us wasn't an election in November of 1994. What was at stake for us was really about the future of the immigrant community in general. And it wasn't just about undocumented people. It was about making sure that Latinos were treated with the dignity that they deserve, but also that Latinos were part of California, that we couldn't be excluded, not from one election, but not from the future of, of the planning of the state, that it wasn't enough for us to simply do what's politically expedient in order to avoid a loss in one election so that we can continue in the same path, depending on people we don't know, to design the future and make decisions for the future of this community. And we thought that it was time for immigrants to take matters into their own hands and continue forward with the march, so, so we did. So if you go back to the people who were the biggest promoters of Prop 187, people like Ron Prince, Alan Nelson, Congressman Rohrabacher, and others, these people had no money. They had no resources. They were people who were out there self-promoting themselves uh, to advance a negative agenda. It wasn't just an anti-immigrant agenda. It was an agenda to promote hatred and division in our country. That was fair. That's what was, what was fair was all about, really. It was about dividing the country. It was about creating, you know, us versus them mentalities. And obviously that took shape in California. But these individuals weren't the principal motor behind the passage of, of Prop 187. That was Pete Wilson. Pete Wilson had the resources. In fact, it was in Pete Wilson's reelection funds that that te famous television commercial about people crossing the border, and they keep coming, that ultimately put the Prop 187 initiative on the map. That's really where the money came from. It was Pete Wilson's reelection into office that reelected Pete Wilson and passed Proposition 187. So these folks will go around even to this day, pat themselves on the back, look at all the great work that we did to pass 187. Yes, they had multiple press conferences and a lot of meetings uh, and did a lot of different things to promote it in the free press, in the earned media uh, cycle. But it was really Pete Wilson. It was Pete Wilson's money that we can all thank for the passage of 187 that made it happen. I think if it wouldn't have been for the labor movement's involvement, and in particular, Gilbert Cedillo, who was the head of the Service Employees International Union, Local 660 in Los Angeles, uh, the big march that we had in October, on October 16th wouldn't have happened. Um, in fact, I think that the entire labor movement, from Jack Henning, who at the time was the head of the California Labor Federation, to Maria Elena Durazo, uh, who was a great leader and one of the only women, woman, I should say, to lead um, a, a local union, and that was the Hotel Restaurant Workers uh, Local 11, that you would not have had the level of support that the immigrant community really needed. Because those of us that were organizing this march, we didn't have the money and, and the resources to make this happen, but the unions did. And the reason why the unions came forward is because they saw in the messaging of the actual campaign against Prop 187, the messaging was so brutal against the immigrants that I think that they felt that we needed to defend the immigrants because many of them were also workers that the unions represented. Some of them were laborers, part of the laborers union. Some were hotel restaurant workers. Others were janitors who were part of the janitors movement, was also part of SEIU. And the unions came together because they saw that the community and the immigrants was the future of California. But they also saw that it was wrong the way they were being treated. The messaging around this campaign was horrible. Really, literally, the messaging was Latinos need to stay away from saying to people that they should vote no against Proposition 187. Why? Because non-Latinos don't want to see Latinos talk to them. Like we need to hide under a rock. And the messaging in the polling showed, incidentally, that the best way to get non-Latinos, and white voters in particular, to vote no on Proposition 187 
was to spread the fear that if you wouldn't immunize and provide health care to the undocumented population, then that we would have the spread of disease in California. And that was the number one talking point to get people to vote against Proposition 187. I think the unions listened to this messaging. I think they paid attention, they put their ear to the ground, and they decided that it was important uh, for them to join this movement and to say no, and to say enough is enough. We need to stand with the undocumented workers. And eventually that's what they did. And so we, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the unions, to, to Gil Cedillo, and to many others who, who came forward to, to help provide the resources so that uh, we could organize these, this march. The support that we received from all of the Spanish language media outlets, uh, not the least of which was La Opinión, who was incredibly helpful, Univision, Telemundo, uh, uh, Channel 22, uh, many others who came forward, uh, a lot of radio stations came forward and said, we want to be part of this effort, we want to help you. When they saw that we were organizing, we would have press conferences. And many times the only people covering the press conferences was the Spanish media. Uh, and, and, and we learned that the only way to show people that they should come out to defend their rights in this struggle for their own dignity was that they themselves had to take this fight to the streets. They couldn't rely on other people uh, to do this for them. And I think ultimately it, it was easier to convince people because we did a couple of trial runs before we did the big march uh, on October 16th. We did a march, for example, in January uh, of 1994 and there were no immigration raids during that march. I think that's the thing people feared the most. We did another march in May, um, and that march where we mobilized over 10,000 people from East LA to Boyle, uh, from, I'm sorry, from uh, Cinco Puntos, Bo uh, Boyle Heights to City Hall. And then we did the big march, obviously in October, the one that mobilized over 100,000 people. And I think that the real turning point for a lot of these immigrants was that they saw it as important, that they needed the fight for their kids wasn't just a sacrifice they made to leave everything behind, to come to the U.S. and to sacrifice themselves, but that once they were here, they needed to continue to struggle. Uh, and, and I think that was very telling for them to know that in order for their kids to have a better life, they needed to do more. They needed to fight for themselves, uh, and they did. And I think they did it with a lot of dignity and, and, and people uh, recognized that these workers meant something, that their lives were important, that the way they were being depicted in the English media as being people who were just coming to this country to abuse the country, to take the services, uh, uh, was not who they were. They were contributors to the economy, they worked hard, and that they were leaving real legacies behind for their kids to follow that. You know, the, 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 this notion that hard work is something to be proud of, whether you're a gardener or a maid or uh, whether you work in a kitchen, that it didn't matter. That what mattered the most was that you worked hard and that you sacrificed yourself to give your kids the life you never had. Well, I was living in Pomona uh, at the time, so Pomona is, you know, maybe by car, 40, 35, 40 minutes away from uh, Boyle Heights. And um, uh, Gil Cedillo had arranged uh, for something like 45 buses uh, to pick up some of the people that we were organizing in the Inland Empire. And I remember us saying to people, let's meet at six in the morning. Uh, and the buses are gonna show up at 5 a.m. But at six in the morning, let's uh, congregate ourselves. We gave them a specific location. And I showed up around 6.15, and I saw people lined up around an entire block waiting to get on these buses. And that said to me, wow, this is, this is pretty serious. You know, we, we're going to have a lot of people at this march. And um, I went down to, uh, to the march. When we got to the location that the march started, which is a place called Cinco Puntos, very famous uh, uh, street corner uh, in Boyle Heights, um, there were a number of people there already, thousands of people. It was hard to even get in. And 
I could just feel uh, the, the pulse of the humanity of people that were there. Um, it wasn't just the workers, incidentally. It was the immigrants, it was their kids. In some cases, it was three generations of people uh, that were there. And I remember uh, telling Juan Jose, well, this is gonna be a big march. And Juan Jose is saying, yeah, you know, let's, you know, he, he was still concerned about whether or not uh, the Border Patrol would come and, you know, what is the equivalent of ICE now at the time was the, the Border Patrol, um, that they would come and deport people or try to make arrests. But we knew that the police wasn't going to be making arrests because we had all the permits with the city. Um, and so we were a bit nervous. Um, but that nervousness was overtaken by this great feeling of relief that, okay, people did come, people are showing up. And so when we began that march, um, I noticed that as we were marching down the street, there were people coming out of their homes who were not planning on being part of the march, who decided to join the march. And this happened throughout the entire uh, uh, route of the, of the, of the, of the march. We would have people walk out of their homes and look at what we were doing, and then they would go in, and they would get ready, and they would come back and join the march uh, as the procession continued on to, to City Hall and to the LA Times building, which is where we had the main stage. Um, when we were going through the downtown area, right when we hit the downtown area, I remember um, in a lot of the factories that were still there um, in the upper floors, people waving at us, um, people clapping as we were walking by, and then they would themselves, then you wouldn't see them again, and then you would see them join the march. So as the march commenced and as it proceeded, more and more people began to join. And it was folks from all walks of life. It wasn't just Latino immigrants. Um, it was all the folks that sympathized with this movement. And when we got to City Hall and we got on the stage, and I looked out, and you could see a sea of people, blocks and blocks down from the stage. And um, we had folks who were actually counting the number of people that, that we had. Um, and by our own estimation, it was clearly over 75,000 people. But by the time the speeches started from the stage, there were over 100,000 people in downtown Los Angeles is that never before in the history of Los Angeles had there been a march that had mobilized that many people in downtown LA or anywhere uh, in, the, in the city of Los Angeles. And it was very impressive. Not so much because people gave great speeches. You know, we didn't have a Dr. King like the Civil Rights Movement had that from, you know, the mall uh, uh, of the... Um, the, the Lincoln Memorial gave an historic speech that ultimately really was the turning point of the civil rights movement. This was very different. There were a lot of speeches, but people said different things, and some were very powerful. But the most powerful thing wasn't the speeches. I remember looking around and seeing how people behaved themselves. It was the behavior of the collection of people that were there, that were amassed there, uh, around the LA Times building and the blocks there, City Hall. That really, to me, was the message. It was, it was the faces of all of these people, the dignity with which they carried themselves. Some people wore white. Some people, yeah, had Mexican flags. Other people had American flags. But really, the flag that was there was the flag of the people that represented really the lives of dreams and aspirations of, of hundreds of thousands and millions of families of people who made their way to the United States for the very same reason that the pilgrims came to the United States, right? to make a better life for themselves, to, you know, to try and reach that dream, that hope for opportunity for a better life for them and themselves. And that really, to me, that's really what that march was about. It was about those people, and it was about their right to be. It was about them saying, look, we're not less than human. We are human, and we want to be here.
because we care about this country. And they demonstrated their caring so much that if you looked around, there was no trash anywhere. Folks picked up the trash, would put it into the, into the trash bins, and they left everything spotless and clean, I think as a, dem as a demonstration of who they were and what they represented to say that we want to be welcome in this country. We want to be welcome in this state. You know, the, the, the bigoted and racist, xenophobic campaign against them wasn't right. And whether the polls showed that Prop 187 was going to pass or not, these people were there to say, look, we don't have a vote, but we have our dignity. We have ourselves. And we're here to tell you that we're not a danger to you. We want to be part of this America. We want to be part of this quilt of diversity of this country that has made this country so great. And though Prop 187 did pass, and many people blamed us and blamed the march for the passage of, of, of this mean-spirited and pernicious initiative, at the end of the day, it changed everything because a lot of people saw in these immigrants what they wanted people to see, which is that these are hardworking people, that they're here to contribute, not to take. And I think that that has changed California uh, in many, many ways. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I think the criticism of the march uh, for all of the Mexican flags is, is, is valid criticism. When you have 100,000 people, you can't control what people are going to do. And we initially thought that we would have 30, 40, 50,000 people. So we brought 10,000 flags. We have boxes of flags at the beginning of the march so people can march with these American flags. And they were there. But people brought their own flags. And I think it was for them a way of saying, look, I may be Mexican and I'm proud of being Mexican, but I want you to look at me and treat me with respect. Um, and I think ultimately it could have backfired to some degree, but I think in the end, uh, people had the right to express what they wanted to express. Well, Prop 187 after its passage and the reaction to it, the large number, hundreds of thousands of Latino immigrants that became U.S. citizens and began to exercise their right to vote changed the entire political scenario such that a lot of Latinos started getting elected into office. In 94, you have people like Antonio Villarraigosa, uh, Alex Padilla, who's now Secretary of State, Kevin De Leon, who obviously uh, went to the State Assembly and then went uh, to become uh, President of the State Senate. Gil Cedillo was one of the very first who got elected right after 187, Tony Cárdenas in Congress, Hilda Solís that ultimately became a member of Congress, many, many other Latinos as a consequence of this effort ultimately got elected into important positions of power. People on the city council in Los Angeles, uh, to state governments, and you see it today where Latino representation on boards and commissions uh, is much more diverse than it has ever been because prior to 1994, that wasn't the case. You could count the number of Latinos elected to an office in California, you know, basically with one hand. And now you have a multitude of them um, that, you know, have different ideologies. Not everybody's going to think alike, but for the most part, uh, I think that it, had, it, it has helped not only bring about diversity, but it has also helped um, reestablish California for what it is today, uh, which is the most progressive state in the country. Richard Polanco was a real pioneer um, in the California, reshaping the California ele electoral system by finding and identifying strong candidates, Latino candidates throughout the state that could represent multiple communities and that were electable. Uh, and Richard identified any number of people up and down the state of California and ran them for office against other Democrats who were non-Latinos. And they eventually won those primary elections and then ran in November for the, under the general election. And thus, uh, they put together uh, a collection of people in the California legislature that made up a California Latino Legislative Caucus that exists to this day. 
And I think Richard Polanco deserves a lot of credit for the immense work that he did in identifying these candidates, in identifying political consultants to run those campaigns, and in showing people in a very, very divisive environment that it was okay to elect this, this or that Latino person to represent them in Sacramento, uh, whether they were in Latino districts or not. And Richard Polanco was really a pioneer who paved that path uh, for others of us who came after that ultimately were also elected uh, to office to show and demonstrate that, that there was an opportunity for people to look at uh, the political system in California and see that it was possible to elect Latinos to the state legislature in this state in California. In 1994, there were a few allies, um, but we knew that we were right. Something told us uh, that um, the political establishment had its role, um, but we had our role as well. And that, you know, we always believe that the only way to bring about change for immigrants was to transform the entire political landscape. And so that electoral politics in one election cycle wasn't going to do that for us. That we needed to do is to create a social movement that ultimately over time, gradually, these immigrants themselves were going to become citizens, that were going to start voting. And that was going to change the entire political landscape. And so for us, it wasn't just a question of being idealistic, because obviously we were in our 20s and we were young and, and we still felt like we could change the world. Um, it, it was more than that. It, it was pragmatic. It was being practical. It was understanding that the political environment was such that it was going to be repressive towards immigrants until and unless they too became citizens and began to exercise their right to vote. And as a consequence, of all of the work that was done by us and many other people as well, over five million people between 1994 and, and the year 2000 have become citizens uh, in the United States, immigrants themselves. And so that changed the political landscape for California so that when candidates for office campaign, they campaign in immigrant communities now. Some of them even uh, attempt to speak Spanish. Those that don't know and those that do will speak Spanish. Um, but it wasn't so much about saying, hey, we're Latinos. It wasn't about identifying ourselves as Latinos. It was really about identifying ourselves as human beings to say, listen, just because we're Latinos, don't treat us any, more, any different because we want the same things that any other California family wants. The right to uh, living the California dream, the dream of hope and opportunity, right? It, it, Latinos want the same thing everybody else wants. They want a good education for their kids, a better life for their kids. Uh, and, and, you know, they want affordable housing. They want good paying jobs. Uh, they want a strong economy. They want to move into the middle class and have a strong middle class in, in, in this state. And so I think it took people a little bit to understand that the hopes and aspirations of these Latino immigrants are no different than the hopes and aspirations of any other ordinary uh, American or Californian. Um, but over time, I think that that has changed in this state to where if you look at what happened in the last election, you know, California passed the first sanctuary state law of any other country, any other state in the country. And you would think, well, why did that happen? You know, how did that happen? How is it that in California, you cannot get elected to statewide office today? if you're a Republican. Why is that? Why is California the most progressive state in the union today? It didn't happen overnight. It didn't happen because it's always been this way. You know, this was a Jim Crow state in the early 90s. You know, California was one of the most conservative states in the country for many, many years. Uh, but that has changed, and it's changed for the better. And even though we still have a lot of work to do, to address the issue of homelessness, uh, the economic inequities between the haves and the have-nots, um, building the type of environment that affords people the right to be able to put a roof over their head and have affordable housing um, and, and have you know, a strong job market. We still have a lot of work to do. But if you look at the area of the environment, for example, if you look at the area of civil rights, California is 
far ahead of many, many other states. And we think that a lot of those things happen due to the work that happened before 1994, but the movement in 1994 against Pete Wilson and against Proposition 187, I believe, really was the turning point and the catalyst to move California from where it was, which was a very conservative state, to where it is today, which is the most progressive state in the country. And so people like myself, who you know, came from a very humble family. My father came to this country as a farm worker. My mother was a maid. Eventually, my father settled in in San Diego, and he was a gardener. My mom was a maid. And you know that's who I am. And I'm very proud of, of what my parents have done and how hard they have worked. But to think that I became um, the speaker of the California State Assembly and served in that capacity for four and a half years uh, was something I would have never thought would have happened. But one of the f things I did that uh, I'm most proud of, besides raising the minimum wage by, by $1.25, um, is passing the most progressive uh, environmental law in the world today, which is AB 32, uh, uh, which is you know, the only law in the books that has a massive reduction of CO2 emissions by mandate. You know, many countries hit goals of emissions reductions. My, the law that I pass under, under my leadership when I was speaker, uh, AB 32, is a mandate to reduce carbon emissions um, in the most significant way uh, that anybody has ever done. And the law is in effect today, and it's working very, very well. Uh, but yet, that ca I, I came out of an experience of immigrants and helping immigrants. Uh, but it speaks to the point that, yes, we're Latinos, and yeah, we want to we want to help Latinos, but we don't just want to help Latinos. We want to help all people who have been marginalized and set aside uh, and impoverished. And that we are not here just to help ourselves. Uh, you know, more important than being Latinos, we're human beings. Uh, and we're here to, to help everyone. And I think that, you know, the lessons for us out of 187 were that we can't just think about ourselves. That we have to join with everyone else uh, to fight for what's right for everybody. Because once you start singling yourself out, ultimately, you can marginalize yourself. Um, and, and, you know, which is something that happened with us during the 1994 fight. We, we, marg we were marginalized, but it wasn't uh, out of desire uh, uh, or necessity. It was because other people <laughs> marginalized us. Uh, they didn't want us in the mainstream of American society. We had to force our way there. Uh, and so we have still have a lot of work to do. There's no question about it. Uh, we can't rest on our laurels. Um, but 1994 was a pivotal year. And I would say for me, um, if it had not been for my involvement at One Stop, uh, for my work organizing immigrants, defending undocumented immigrants in particular, uh, and being one of the, the primary organizers of that, that march against 187, I don't think I would be where I am today. Um, and so I think that, you know, all those things that, that I ha have always believed in and continue to this day to believe in um, have really, were really shaped by all of those uh, uh, efforts around Proposition 187. And so in some ways, we have Pete Wilson to thank for a lot of this. Because if you look at the initiative, Prop 187, you know, Ron Unz didn't have any money. You know, Congressman Rohrabacher, who was one of the principal promoters of Proposition 187, he didn't raise very much money for the initiative. You know, none of these people did. Alan Nelson, they were out there to promote themselves and their ideology, their, promote the hatred and the division that people like President Donald Trump promotes today. These individuals didn't have any resources. The money came from the reelection funds for Governor Pete Wilson. It was Governor Pete Wilson with his commercials on TV, uh, with his anti-immigrant rhetoric that was so divisive that brought this state together. And so we're thankful to Pete Wilson, Governor Wilson, because for all the wrong reasons, we ended up in the right place.